Hi friends, thank you so much for joining us for this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy's. We would love to have you join us every Monday night at St. Timothy Catholic Church in Laguna Niguel from 7.30 to 8.30 in person. But if you live far away, you weren't able to be here this week, you're not able to get to us, we're so happy to have this recorded and available for you online so you can still participate. So while you're here, please make sure you like this video and subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications so you get notified every time we have a new video, whether it's a Bible study or some other content that we're putting out there. And please leave your questions and your reflections in the comments below so that we can answer those, we can get to know you, and that you can share with all those other people who are watching online. So without further ado, please enjoy this recording of our weekly Bible study. God bless. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of this evening. We invite the presence of your Holy Spirit to be among us, to guide us in our conversation, to guide us to deeper understanding of your word, and especially, Lord, to guide us to you. We pray, Lord, tonight that any distractions, worries, anxieties, anything that may be difficult for us to focus, anything that's an obstacle to us entering into tonight, we pray, Lord, that you would remove those things from us so that we can be fully present and fully attentive to however you want to speak to each one of us. You have a unique message of love and purpose for each one of us tonight, and so give us the strength and the ability to listen for your voice in the words of Scripture and in the words we share with one another. Bless this time we lay it at your feet, and we ask all these things in your most mighty name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. Have a seat. Come on in. We are in Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 21. Matthew 22, verses 15 through 21. This is the section of the Gospel of Matthew about paying taxes to the emperor. A very familiar story. You've probably heard it many times before. So where are we in the Gospel of Matthew? Remember Jesus has now entered into Jerusalem. It's the events that we commonly celebrate during Holy Week, the last week of his life. And it's still this kind of first day in Jerusalem where he's having these, uh, or first few days in Jerusalem where he's having these interactions and tensions with the Pharisees. So we just finished last Sunday the parable of the wedding feast, and it was the third of three judgment parables that Jesus is proclaiming against the Pharisees. Okay, so now Jesus has kind of railed at them three times. And so now we have three questions posed to Jesus that are trying to entrap him in speech. And this is the first one posed by the Pharisees. So now that Jesus has pronounced these parables of judgment to them, they are firing back as best they can uh, by asking these questions, trying to put Jesus in a precarious theological position. And uh, we'll see what happens. Spoiler alert, they don't get him. So uh, Matthew 22, verses 15 through 21, we're in Jerusalem, in the temple area, Jesus with his disciples, probably a crowd is forming. There's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders, the chief priests, all that kind of group around in Jerusalem. So let's read this first time through. This is what um, is happening, just to get a sense for what is being said. Matthew 22, 15, paying taxes to the emperor. Then the Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him. And with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man, and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the, ce the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. And Jesus said to them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that, Jesus said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were amazed, and leaving him, they went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel for Sunday only goes to 21, but I just threw in that last verse because, you know, why not? So, now you get a picture for what's being said here. Uh, you have the image in your mind, this confrontation, probably something you've heard many times before. 
The second time through, I invite you to listen and see if anything stands out to you for any particular reason. Invite kind of God to speak to you in the second time through and see if a word resonates with you, a detail, something maybe you haven't noticed before. And just pay attention to that. Why is this standing out to me? What are you trying to say to me, Lord, through this word, this phrase, this detail? Could be something insignificant, doesn't seem to have anything to do with the meaning of the passage. All that matters is it means something to you. So let's listen for that the second final time through. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man, and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. Jesus said to them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were amazed, and leaving him, they went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So, now that we've read that twice through, uh, reflect on those things that stood out to you, uh, if you have any, as well as any questions that you have about this passage. If you're listening or watching this later, please let us know. But for those of us here, we're going to take about the next 10 minutes at your tables. If you're at a sparse table, feel free to join. There's room up here, room up here, combined together. Uh, what stands out to you in this passage? What questions do you have about it? And then we'll bring it back to the larger group for some Q&A and discussion. So take about the next 10 minutes or so. I heard a lull, so I, I broke in. Um, so a few things about the, uh, maybe a little bit of history that might be useful um, as we look at this passage. Uh, you'll hear in the first reading for this upcoming Sunday in, uh, in Isaiah, uh, what is it, in Isaiah 45, there's a prophecy from the prophet Isaiah saying that one named Cyrus will be like a Messiah or a savior for the people. And at that time, the Hebrew people were about to go into exile, and they're in exile for 70 years. This is about 500, 600 years before Jesus. And finally, a king named Cyrus of Persia comes to power, and sure enough, the prophecy comes true. He lets all the Jewish people go free, return home, and practice whatever religion they would like to. So the Persian Empire is, is at, in power, but the Jewish people get to go home, rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. This is about 530 years before Jesus. And so as they do this, they're, they're having partnerships with the other world powers. They're getting the materials they need to, uh, to build their temple, and they're doing pretty well. And then in the third century before Christ, a uh, man you may have heard of, Alexander the Great, comes to power, and the Greek Empire kind of spreads everywhere. And they take over this area in Israel and Jerusalem, and it becomes part of the Greek Empire. And their goal is to Hellenize everyone, make them like the Greeks. And so you can read about this in First and Second Maccabees about how the Greek Empire comes in and tries to make everyone Greek. They erect statues of their own gods in the temple. They desecrate the temple. They start introducing Greek customs, Greek food, Greek culture, Greek practices to the people in Jerusalem. And a lot of people start listening. However, there's one family that doesn't, the Maccabees, and they fight back, this small family and the small group of kind of rebel Jews fight back against the, uh, that sounded very Star Wars-y when I said it just now, um, but they fight back against the, uh, the Greek Empire and they win. Uh, and at this point, the Greek Empire had been splintered and divided, so they weren't as strong as they were with Alexander the Great. But they win. They purify the temple. It's where we get the, the uh, Feast of Hanukkah from, where the Jews get the Feast of Hanukkah from. And from about 167 all the way um, up until the time of Christ, they're a relatively independent nation until the Roman Empire and the Roman world power comes to be. And so they end up invading the area of Jerusalem um, about 63 BC. But when they take over, they entrust the leadership of Jerusalem to local kings. So this is where we get people like King Herod the Great. He's a local Jewish king, not a very good Jewish person, but he's Jewish nonetheless, culturally. 
And he's a king that's put in power of the area, but he's under the authority of Rome. And so when this happens, Rome now has a foothold in Judea. In about the year 6 AD, after Jesus has already been born, Rome comes in and makes Judea a province of the Roman Empire, which means they now have kind of a more official presence in the area. They start putting in people like governors or uh, procurators like Pontius Pilate, putting these people in power. And part of that means that they now get to take what's called a census tax or a head tax, the poll tax. It has different names, but it basically is a tax that you pay because you exist in the Roman Empire. That's it. And so people are not happy about this tax. And in that same year, Judas the Galilean leads a very famous rebellion against Rome, and Rome comes down and brings the hammer. And they completely quash this rebellion. And they have now this very tense relationship with the Jews, and they institute people like tax collectors and things like that to make sure they're getting the taxes that are needed for the Roman Empire to survive. And so this relationship between them is very strained. But this is the tax. It's just a, a head tax. You exist in the Roman Empire. You need to pay the equivalent of one denarius, so one day's wages as this tax. Okay? So one denarius, it's a Roman coin, and we see this other places where people are paid a day's wage. It's a denarius. It's a specific Roman coin that was printed uh, and circulating in this empire. Okay? So that is, is the coin that's being paid. That's why they have to pay it, and that's how this relationship kind of developed. The problem with this among other things, is that for the Jews, they have a very specific commandment. And it's the first commandment in Exodus chapter 4, or Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. We know the commandment. It says, you shall have no other gods besides me. But it continues, it says, you shall not make yourself an idol or a likeness of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down before them or serve them. And so part of this meant you couldn't make any kind of what's called a graven image, an image that was meant for servitude or worship in any kind of earthly way. So all of us today in the currency that we have, we have kind of graven images. They're called, you know, uh, at the time they would be called effigy coins. They have an effigy of a person, a likeness of a person. All of our dollar bills, all of our coins, they have presidents or other figures on them. And so for the Jews at that time, you were not allowed to pay anything associated with the temple, the temple tax, or give any kind of offering with a effigy coin. It was considered an idol. And so even to carry it around was a little bit suspect. That's why there's money changers at the temple. That's why there's all this difficulty and, and anger about being taxed and having these circulated coins. But this has become the dominant currency that's used for everything. And so you can, you can see, if you know that history, why this is such a tense situation. Okay? And then we have these two groups of people that approach Jesus, the disciples of some Pharisees. The Pharisees are very legalistic. They're very passionate about the law, so they know this commandment, and they know that this tax and paying this tax in the way that we're, they're being asked to pay this tax is a, probably a violation of this commandment. But what they do, which is super shady, they go and they get the Herodians. The Herodians are people who are loyal to Herod. They are totally fine with Roman occupation. In fact, they think it's a benefit to them. They want to become more like the Romans. They want to become Hellenized. They want this great culture to be part of them. And so they have no problem with paying this tax. In fact, they see Caesar as the real true king, the true emperor. And so they pose this question to try and entrap Jesus, that if he says, no, you shouldn't pay this tax, then, well, he'd agree with the Pharisees, but then the Herodians can entrap him and say he's trying to incite a rebellion or a riot against Rome, just like Judas the Galilean had done about 25 years earlier. And if he says, yes, you should pay the tax, then the Pharisees can write him off and say, oh, he doesn't really care about the law. He's not a rabbi worth listening to. Notice that the Pharisees, they're not going to care if Jesus agrees with them. If Jesus says, no, don't pay this tax, it's not like the Pharisees are like, yeah, one of us, one of us. Like they're just, they care more about entrapping Jesus so that they can write him off, or even worse, lead him to his death, than they do with him agreeing with their suspicion. So these two groups of people that otherwise would disagree about pretty much everything, they come together in their one common ground, which is opposition to Jesus. The way that he's preaching, the way that he's living, the way that he's teaching his disciples is, is rubbing both of these groups the wrong way. 
And so, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of is at play. They see Jesus as a common enemy. So they come together, unlikely partners, to try and entrap Jesus. And obviously we see how it goes. But that gives you a little bit of context as to who's playing here, what's going on, and why they have this tax, what they're trying to do here with Jesus. They ask him a yes or no question where both answers would get him in trouble, which is exactly why Jesus doesn't answer the question. The very common tactic of Jesus and of rabbis is to answer a question with a question. In fact, Jesus has asked questions uh, over 300 times in Scripture, and he only answers about a dozen of them. Most of the time, he asks a question, and he himself initiates asking questions about 170 times in, in Scripture. It's a common teaching tactic of rabbis, but it also prevents him from being able to get trapped and from him actually being able to relay wisdom and attack these different uh, nefarious intentions of his enemies without being very aggressive or circumspect in any way. So that gives a little bit of context. I hope that's helpful. Any questions or uh, things that stood out to you in this passage? Yeah. Maybe the greater meaning of this is Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not of this world. Yeah, in one sense, yes. Yeah. I mean, in addition to getting out of the problem, because he's yeah. going to die anyway, but there's a different emphasis that render under God what is God, mm -hmm. whatever that is, it's yeah. necessarily a burnt, an offering to burn in the temple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he also says, pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So he is making kind of an earthly statement about our responsibility to the common good on earth. You know, and this is actually, this falls under, in the catechism, under, I believe, under the fourth commandment, when it's honoring our father and our mother, it also applies to honoring civil authorities and our obligations to civil authority, that we are meant to pay our taxes, follow the law making sure we're having respect for those in civil authority, even if we disagree with them, because God in some way placed them there or is working through them for our greater good, using the fact that they are in that office to somehow bring about our greater good, whether we disagree or agree with them. And so part of that is the respect that is asked of us as Christians for the common good. But then he says, render unto God what belongs to God. And what belongs to God? Everything. 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 The only reason we have civil authority in the first place, the only reason we have hierarchical structures, money, gifts, goodness, blessing, is all because of God. So eventually, it all needs to go back to him as well. But part of that is being faithful to our roles and responsibilities in everyday life, in society, in our family, whatever that, that calls for. Now, the, the catechism does specify, I think this is in paragraph 2242, specifies that if the uh, government or civil authority is asking you to do something that is immoral, you do not have to do that, but you cannot then write off all of your other responsibilities. It is still expected that you contribute what is necessary to the common good. Even if you're in a governmental structure or societal structure that is corrupt, that is compelling you to do immoral things, you don't do the immoral things, but you still then can't just write it off entirely. You still have a responsibility. We also have a responsibility to ensure the common good, to do the, you know, uh, the seven components of Catholic social teaching, to uh, advocate for those things, to follow those laws that Jesus has given us, to follow the Ten Commandments. They don't get done away with just because we're living in a difficult situation. But that cannot then compel us. Same thing is true of our parents. We're meant to obey and respect our parents, but if they're compelling us to do something immoral, then we no longer are called to obey them. So the morality, the law of the Lord, our relationship with the Lord comes first in all things. Other uh, questions, thoughts, Greg? Is there another version in this gospel where that trick is explained, where they say, if Jesus says, you know, give it to, give the money to the emperor, mm. then he's like, he's loyal to the emperor, or he's, he's against the Jews, but he gives it to the Jews, and he's a traitor to Caesar. I, it seems like I, I read something like that in a gospel before. Maybe, so this also appears in Mark 12, Let's look. I did look at the parallel, but it's been a week, so. Um, paying taxes to the emperor. Nope, it's not explained there. Not that I can see. And then in Luke 20 is the other parallel. Uh, 
Um, no, Luke just kind of says they were um, unable to trap him by something he might say before the people. Elaborates a tiny bit that that was their goal, but it's pretty clear also in this one. Um, I'm just skimming. I may have missed something, but those are the only two parallels um, of this passage. One in Mark, one in Luke. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Jonathan. This is sort of a minor nitpicky thing, but, it's, but um, he calls them hypocrites. Mm -hmm. And as I thought it through, I said, he's talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are asking the question. The Rodians are saying, mm -hmm. and he's calling them hypocrites because he knows they don't believe in paying the tax. And so they're trying to get him to say, you should pay the tax. Mm -hmm. and you hypocrites. Yes. But also, what does he say after that? Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin. They're in the temple area. Pharisees and the disciples of Pharisees, if they really believed that you shouldn't pay the tax, would they have the coin? No. But do they? Yep, they do. Yes, this was commonly used, but Roman law had a provision for the Jews that they could print their own currency in copper that didn't have effigies on them. What most Jews did is they refused to carry the amount of copper that would be necessary to be the equivalent of the, the denarius, which was silver, because it, you would have to carry around a lot more. So out of a manner of convenience, they chose to carry this idolatrous coin, even though they were so puffed up in what they would say, that, oh no, we shouldn't pay this tax, we shouldn't make false idols, and yet their pockets are lined with the very thing that they're, they're preaching against. So that's why Jesus says, you hypocrites. It's very clever, though, of the Pharisees, because the Pharisees, is it, the Pharisees are not the ones who question Jesus. You notice? In the very beginning, they sent their disciples to him. The students of the Pharisees. So if the disciples fa uh, fail, the Pharisees can be like, oh, our silly students, they didn't know enough. And if they succeed, then they can say, look how, look how great we did at educating our disciples. So either way, they kind of have a, a way out. They're being very, very manipulative here, very nefarious in the way that they're kind of, they're, they're being very safe and protecting themselves, probably because they know it's going to be very difficult to entrap this person. And it's a good thing, too, because Jesus lets them have it. He points out the fact that he knows that they have these coins. In the temple area, sacred space, where that is the last place you should be having any kind of coin like that, let alone having it at all. And yet, because of their comfort and their convenience, it had become commonplace. And as I was reading this, that was the question for reflection, at least for me, that, that this reading posed, which was, how are you, how am I, compromising my faith for the sake of comfort or convenience? Are there ways in which you and I are compromising our faith, refusing to stand up, refusing to share, failing to do so out of comfort or convenience. Because that's part of the hypocrisy Jesus is speaking to here. You know, you think you are so well thought in your position and standing firm in this just place, and yet you are the hypocrite who is carrying around this coin. You know, if we really preach to believe in Jesus, to believe in the great commandments, to love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, are there ways we've compromised that? Or that we fail to live up to that because of comfort or because of convenience. Yes. The, the Herodians, just in being loyal to Romans, that's hypocritical, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he could be addressing it to both of them. Yeah. One for denying the law, and then one for pretending to follow the law, but obviously carrying around this coin and not caring as much as they say they do about it. You know, there are other areas where in Scripture where Jesus kind of talks about the, the money. There's the one about the widow's mite, if you remember this, where the widow comes and puts just a few coins in the treasury. And in the treasury, in the temple, it was a very publicly viewable area. And the treasury was this area kind of in, in a common center square as you're approaching the inner part of the temple. And it, it, on both sides were these kind of metallic, like horns that came out of the wall. And you would kind of pour your offering into these holes, it would go down into the kind of the treasury area where it was kept safe. And they were made of metal. So what Pharisees and what people would do in order to appear very important is you'd go to the money changers and they would change these massive sums of money for a lot of small metallic coins, like denarius. So you would just hear this like coin star sound of all of their offering. And look how great I am. 
And so this idea of money, I mean, Jesus himself says you cannot serve both God and mammon. Uh, it is harder for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to enter the eye of a needle. All of these statements about how this is compromising their ability to see the kingdom of God clearly, compromising their ability to follow the law faithfully. Not that money is bad, but love of money is what scripture says. Love of money is the root of all evil. And that is what the Pharisees are falling into. They love the convenience. They love how the ability of this day's wage coin can make them look when they're pouring that offering into the public treasury. And yet they are the ones who are questioning Jesus, who is right, pure, and just in all of his intentions and teachings. That's why he calls them out. Yes? And they were, I guess, right either in the temple or right outside the temple. Mm -hmm. Were they changing copper into Roman coins? Because what kind of coins did they put into the, for the temple offering? Yeah, so they would, they would be putting non-effigy coins for the temple offering. So people would bring a denarius, they'd change it out for, for copper. However, they'd also be selling uh, animals for sacrifice. So for pilgrimage feasts, if you're making this big pilgrimage to the temple, you wouldn't bring an animal with you because the animal would get scraped up along the way. And if they got scraped up, if they had a cut or a blemish, they were now considered not appropriate for sacrifice. And you've just lost the efficiency of that animal for that purpose. So a lot of them were in there. The problem with the money changers was that they used to be out in the Kidron Valley, which is right where you would come up through to get to Jerusalem, and they would change money there. They were instrumental in kind of this, uh, this is a very, such a weird modern political like kind of parallelism, but they were instrumental in helping Caiaphas get elected as high priest. And so he, as, a, as kind of a deal with them, allowed them to come into the area of the temple called the Court of the Gentiles. It's one of the outermost areas of the temple. And it was because of that shift, this kind of partnership with all of, I mean, it's very kind of like, if you're thinking about the impurity, the, the effigy coins, it's almost kind of like a dirty practice that they even have to do this. And then the high priest himself saying, sure, come on into an inner part of the temple because of what you've done for me. That was this kind of way Jesus was saying, look at the authority structure that you have. It is nothing in comparison to what it should be. And so I, having the authority I do from God, and being the son of God, being divine myself, I remove this so-called authority from this temple because it's not worthy to be here. Very likely, yes, yeah, yeah. But all of that would have happened usually out in the Kidron Valley. But since uh, in, in the, maybe in the, maybe 10 year, 10 to five years, within 10 to five years of this moment, or no, when is Caiaphas elected? Uh, Caiaphas, I think, is elected around the time that rebellion happened. So it had probably been going on for a while, actually, that they were in that, that area. But uh, I'd have to look that up. I can't remember. Because Caiaphas is still around when Annas, his father-in-law, who was the high priest, is still, around, is still living. And so they both are sometimes called the high priest. So I get them confused. Is that legal according to their rules? Yeah. I mean, whoever's the elected high priest. I mean, it was common, I think, for you to die in office, kind of like Supreme Court, but... Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Yes, Connor. I don't know. You mentioned how like comfortability and complacency. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought more about their arrogance. Sure. They're so arrogant and they're true. Mm -hmm. They think this is true that um, they're ignoring. I mean, you can talk about it right after. The greatest commandment is to love. Mm -hmm. um, and they're so set in their ways that they don't approach Jesus with love. They specifically approach Jesus with malice. Mm -hmm. They don't have any curiosity, any positive intent. They want Jesus to fail. They yeah. want him to suffer. So I, I don't know this observation. I have. Yeah, yeah. And notice notice how they shroud it, right? Do you hear this like kind of buttering up language? Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion for you do not regard a person's status. So tell us then, what is your opinion? I mean, when has anyone ever come up to you about anything and said, please tell me your opinion? And you're like, oh, no thanks, I don't have an opinion about that. Like, we love to share our opinion. This is like the best way to butter somebody up, right? And yet Jesus sees right through it. But this is how they're cloaking their malicious desires in this, this way to kind of butter Jesus up and, and make it seem as though they are approaching him in, in a good light. And to be honest, we do this too sometimes in prayer, don't we? Like, Jesus would be really good if you gave me this because then, you know, I could go to church more, I could pray more, you know, I know you were real because you just, like, gave me this. 
and that'd be super blessed. So if you could do, yeah, you know, like, it, who are we to think like we can like outmaneuver God, right? And yet we do it all the time when we pray. You know, we do this all the time too when we just pray for the same thing over and over again. I criticize this all the time, and I do this too. But like every day, if your prayers are exactly the same every day, like what are you telling God? Like God, in case you forgot in your all-knowing mind, I'm just asking again the thing you already knew before I even asked you out loud the first time. If you could get around to it, I know you're really busy, but maybe you forgot. You know, and God's up there like, oh man, like I'm so busy up here. Thank you. You know, no. Like, we treat him like that all the time. Like, God knows what he's doing. God already is up to something good in your life before you even ask him. Prayer does not change God. It changes us. It changes our attitude of trust toward him. It allows us to learn how to be in better relationship with him, how to ask for the right things. Because the more we ask for the wrong things and don't get them, we start to learn, right? Well, I guess this isn't going to happen. I wonder why. Well, maybe God wants something different. And then all of a sudden, we're asking for the things that God was going to give us all along. You know, so we can fall into this trap, too, of approaching God in a way where we're, we're buttering up, buttering him up, where we're thinking we know where this is going to go. And we have to be aware of that ourselves. But I like this phrase that they use here where they say, uh, for you do not regard a person's status. In the original Greek, it's a better translation is you do not look to the face of man. And it reminded me of that passage in 1 Samuel 16, where the prophet Samuel, he goes to Jesse's house to anoint the next king. And he sees the oldest child, and he says, surely this one, strong in stature, this is the next king. And what does God say to him? He says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not judge from his appearance or his lofty stature, because I have rejected him. God does not see as a mortal who sees the appearance. The Lord looks into the heart. Isn't it interesting that they are buttering up, him up with words that they're accidentally using to affirm the same way we hear God described, God himself described in 1 Samuel, as one who does not look to the face of man, but looks to the heart. It's so interesting how these things happen, how people accidentally acknowledge the divinity of Jesus without even realizing it. And so in trying to entrap Jesus, they accidentally use language to entrap themselves to secretly admitting that Jesus is God using the same words that God has described as having characteristics of in 1 Samuel 16 to describe Jesus, even though they're trying to butter him up. It just shows you, like, in all the intricacies of the ways that maybe the devil is at work in the world or that we're experiencing a spiritual battle or whatever it may be, like, God is so much higher and above all of that. Like, he is not even breaking a sweat, not even blinking an eye in order to defeat the enemy. He's not. All of this is for a purpose. All of this is because he's up to something good. We, in the midst of it, think like, this is pure chaos. This is hell. What's going on? Where are you, God? You know, but he knows exactly what he's doing, just like he did in this scenario. And in situations where it seems like there could only be this way or this way, there could only be this entrapment of a question, yes or no, and both are wrong, both are bad answers leading to some bad outcome, God always has a third way. Always. And so in the ways where we feel maybe like we've had to compromise our faith out of comfort or convenience because we're unwilling to go one way or this way, trust and know that there is always a way. There is always a way if we pursue the Lord. But that doesn't mean that we turn away from the things he's asked of us, that we start to line our pockets, the pockets of our lives with the things that we know that we shouldn't be doing. Did I tell you this story about Henry Nouwen? I don't know if I told you this story. I came across this story about Henry Nouwen. He's one of my favorite theologians. Um, he wrote the book, the, the Return of the Prodigal Son. If you've seen in our chapel, we have that painting, uh, the famous, um, what artist is that? Rembrandt, thank you. I was going to say Rousseau. Rembrandt, this famous uh, Rembrandt painting of the, the story of the Return of Prodigal Son in Luke 15. And Henry Nouwen, he sat in front of this painting in the, in the museum where the original is um, every day for a few weeks, and he wrote this book from the perspective of, of the younger son, the older son, and the father. And it's one of the most famous kind of theological books out there. But he, he went through a lot of different struggles in his own life, and he had an opportunity to meet Mother Teresa. And he was like, Mother Teresa's going to help me out. Like, she's, you know, so he's, he meets, sits down with Mother Teresa, and he, like, starts going into all of the troubles and the struggles in his life. And he's talking for, like, 10 minutes. And you can get the sense that he's kind of, like, exhausting Mother Teresa's presence here. And he's kind of going overboard. And so he kind of quiets down, and Mother Teresa just says, 
Well, um, as long as you spend an hour before the Lord in adoration and you don't do anything that you know is wrong, you'll be fine. And that was it. That's the only advice she gave him. But immediately he began to see, like, the reason why that was so profound is it was so clear that Mother Teresa was looking at my life from God's perspective. And I was looking at my life as if the only perspective was mine. I can't remember why I was going to share that story, but <laughs> hopefully someone else connected the dots and there was a purpose in that for you. But I think in those moments, we would feel very trapped in our own perspective. Like there's only this way or only that way. Like sometimes it takes maybe another person or a chance of getting out of it in order for us to see from God's perspective. Yeah. Um, maybe were you saying like the, the cliche, put yourself in the other person's shoes? Who knows? I, it's literally, I have no clue why I told that story. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yes. Just a little off topic, but just considering the world events right now. Yes. Yeah. This is, you know, friends of mine, this is where all that comes out. Well, where's God? Where's God? Mm -hmm. This is where it is really difficult. Like, you know, it's hard to to say, oh, God's got a plan, you know. Yeah. It's just tough. Right? Yeah. It's just tough with those kind of feeds the people that say, see, where's God? Where's God? Yeah. It's, it's a tough place to be right now. There's a really great song uh, by Matt Marr, and the lyrics uh, of part of the song go, uh, where were you in all of my suffering? Where were you in my doubt and my fear? You were on the cross. And it's a reminder that like in these moments where we're wondering like, where are you God in my suffering? We, in every Catholic church, we can look up at the symbol of the fact that we have a suffering savior who knows what it's like to suffer with us, to suffer for us. That no other religion in history could even fathom the idea that, like, our God, who we deem so great, we killed him. Woo! Like, no one, no one would champion that if it wasn't real. Like, that's, it makes no sense. And yet, because it's true, because it's real, we know that there's deep, profound meaning in that, that God wanted to come down here to be part of our human experience, to live the fullness of it. Jesus suffered more than any human being can suffer. Jesus had more joy than any human being can have joy. He had more righteous anger than any human being can have righteous anger. He wept and had sadness deeper than any human being can have sadness. And so when we are wondering, where is God in the midst of our suffering? On the cross. That's where he is. That's where he's been. That's where he will always be. Yes, he is risen, and he will always be risen too. So we know there's always a victory. There's always a resurrection coming after any crucifixion moment. But it's important to remember in those moments where we are suffering. You know, it's not just Jesus risen from the dead. It's Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus because he hates the fact that death is part of our reality, that suffering is part of our reality. Wisdom chapter 1 verse 13 says, God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. This is not God's plan. God's plan was Garden of Eden. But in order for us to experience real love, we needed a choice. And because we made the wrong choice, or Adam and Eve rather made the wrong choice, and we continue to do the same, free will allows for the experience of suffering. It allows for us to turn away from God. And so from that very point, God had in his mind a rescue mission in his mind for humanity. And he achieved that in Jesus Christ. But we still get to decide if we're going to be a part of it. The suffering can be an obstacle or it can be the doorway. You can see, wow, Jesus has been here on the cross with me this whole time. He didn't want it, but he's in it. Other questions? You? No? Thanks. <laughs> yes. It also says he's inside of you or something like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm a little not dead yet for the O Saint of God part, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're on our way one day. When I feel like I'm close to death, I'll just maybe start like pulling out relics. Of just like, Hold on to this. Just in case. I think that's a really good practice for every Catholic. You know, like you should have like your, your final affairs in order, like your advanced directive, your last will and testament. But then you need to pick the person who's going to start your cause for canonization to your local bishop. I think like you should find that person, you know, and get that like that's your job. So we can all be saints. Like actually, we'll all be saints if we get to heaven, but actually canonize saints. That'd be super cool. So find, find your person. <laughs> Any other final thoughts, questions? Yeah, Greg. You know, we, we have so many obstacles like this where 
the Pharisee or someone comes up and they talk to Jesus. It gives, Jesus gives them an answer that either they can't figure it out or they don't like, and they walk off. Mm -hmm. I just think, what if you need, if like one of these Herodia guys, whatever, they said, well, I'm just going to, that guy's going to split. And he says, why do you think I'm going to hang out around with this guy yeah. a little bit and see what happens, you know? Yeah. That would be nice if there was a gospel with that in there. Yeah. And maybe there were. Maybe black and white. Oh, yeah. Maybe there were hidden people who stayed. But that is so true. So often in these interactions, people come to say what they want to say to Jesus. And when they're not satisfied with the interaction, they leave. Yeah. But we do that too. When we come to prayer, when we come into spiritual experiences, when we want to encounter God, if we don't have the exact encounter, the exact answer, the exact experience that we want, do we stay and ask, okay, how can I come to know or understand what Jesus is inviting me into, that there's something different here for me? Or do we just walk away and be like, oh, that wasn't for me. I didn't like that. Music was off. You know, we start to criticize, you know. So we have to be on guard against that danger as well. Yeah. I actually think the last line that you added in mm -hmm. really does speak to that. You know, oh, yes, yeah. Verses, they were amazed. So yeah. somehow their heart turned, or maybe they believed what they actually said earlier. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but it also still says they went away. Yeah. Yeah, because that's a reality, too. There are plenty of people, even people who sit in the pews every week in our parish, who are amazed at what Jesus did. And yet, inside, in their, in their life, maybe in our lives, we walk away. You know, this is just a one day a week, one hour a week situation for us. And we're amazed by it, we love it, but then the rest of the week we walk away and we do whatever we want to do. We pursue our own desires, earthly pleasures, the things that we know that are not good for us that will be destructive for us. And yet, we still come and we're amazed. And that's what I'm speaking to in that question. In what ways are we compromising? our faith due to convenience or comfort. Because when we get to heaven for our or when we get to our judgment at the end of our life, when we die and we face Jesus, it's not going to be enough to say like, you know, all that stuff you said, really liked it. It was like, that was wild. Best book I ever read. You know, 10 out of 10 would recommend. No, at the end of our life, St. John the Cross says, you will be judged on love alone. How did you love? How did you love the Lord? And how did that love overflow into the lives and the love you have for others, into the relationships, the places you're called to serve? That's it. We'll be judged on love alone. Anything else? Yes? I recently went to a Protestant church where they talked about faith alone saves you. Mm -hmm. And the thought occurred to me, is it right? So I prayed about it. And because it sounds kind of right at first, mm -hmm. then the thought occurred to me like there is a work and it's repentance. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, yeah. It's a grace, grace alone for sure, but there's yeah. that, that work aspect included in the grace. Yeah. And maybe something like that was kind of at play with the Pharisees. They thought, like, okay, if I just believe in the law, just like other, other Christian denominations might say, if I just believe in Jesus, then everything will be fine. And you might err to the side of like the prosperity gospel. It says, if you just believe in Jesus, everything in your life will be great. You'll make more money. You'll be more healthy. You'll be more successful, etc. Or if you just believe in Jesus, that's all you need to do in order for your life to change. Because what Jesus did on the cross was enough. It was sufficient. And yes, it was sufficient. But we need to do our end. When I got married 10 years ago, at the altar of the church where I got married, when my wife said, I promise to love you in good times and bad and sickness and in health. What she did was sufficient. Didn't make us married till I said the other part. My work, my response is required. I need to receive that gift and then respond. And just because we've made that interchange does not mean that we have a good marriage. I need to work each day. She needs to work each day, both of us, in sacrificial service for the other and for our family in order for that to be true. And the same thing is true in our relationship with God. Yes, that moment matters where we accept Jesus Christ into our heart. We say, I believe in you and I want to receive the gift of salvation. And in our tradition, that's through baptism. But after that moment, that doesn't mean that like, okay, now our life is the same. No, we need to work at this new life, this new relationship, or else it's not a relationship. Nothing has really changed if we don't put in the work. And so that's this relationship for us between faith and works. And that relates 
very much to render unto God what is God's. Offer it to him. This isn't just about accepting something that Jesus has given you. You need to make an offering back. What are we doing with the offering, the gift of our life, our time, our talent, our treasure, our presence? How are we offering that back to the Lord? And is it being offered in a way that has meaning? Or is it something that's more comfortable and more convenient for us? Well, I offer God, you know, 10 minutes when I am already happen to be driving and I already happen to be quiet and I already happen to not have any other distractions or other people around. Or am I actively pursuing the Lord in every part of my life? I'm actively setting aside time to where I could be doing something else. It's a sacrifice, but I'm actively setting aside that time to pray. I'm actively setting aside money that I could spend on something else that I might want to spend on something else or things that I might need, but I'm willing to set that need aside because I want to offer those alms for God or for the poor. Or sustenance, food that I need, that I desire, setting that aside to fast for the Lord. Not just, well, I guess I fasted today because I was so busy I didn't have a chance to eat. I'm so holy. Like, no, that's not what happened. That's not fasting. It's about making the sacrifice. We need to offer something back in return. Because everything, everything, brothers and sisters, belongs to God except for our sin. That's the only thing that we can lay ownership to. The only claim that we have. The mistakes that we've made. The sins that we've committed. Those are the only things that our name, our name alone, is uniquely upon. And yet, God loves us enough to say, you don't need to carry those. I died on the cross for you so that you don't have to carry those. And you can only have the overflowed abundance of what I give you by my grace. But still, that requires the work, the response. Are we doing that? Or are we compromising out of convenience, out of comfort? What are those conversations maybe you've shied away from in the workplace or at school or in your family? Where I could have said a little bit more, but I thought maybe I was the only person in the room who thought the way that I do and I don't want to be attacked. I don't want to be canceled. I didn't know if I had all the answers. The ways where all of my friends wanted to go do a certain thing or talk a certain way or joke about a certain person and I didn't want to be the odd person out. I didn't know how to speak up, so I just laughed along. This can happen in small ways and in big ways. And we all are going to face this. If you're not facing it now, and if you haven't before, you will. But on a daily basis, just living in this world, out in the culture, we're going to face it. Because Christianity itself, Catholicism especially, is completely countercultural. It's completely different than the way that the world tells us we're supposed to live. And so we should look different. We should, because this matters. Any final thoughts, words, questions? Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of this word the gift of this community and our presence to one another. Thank you for the ways that your spirit has moved and spoken to each one of us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us take the words that resonated with us tonight and carry them with us throughout this week to allow them to challenge us, to allow them to guide us to deeper faith and deeper relationship with you. And especially, Lord, we ask that you would shed light on the ways in our life that maybe we've become complacent in our faith, the ways that maybe we've compromised it out of comfort or convenience. And to not be afraid to boldly stand up and live for the gift of this faith that you have won for us by dying on the cross for our sins. Because the victory of the resurrection is always on the other side. is always awaiting us. And so no matter the suffering, the doubt, the fear, the anxiety, the worry, there is always a resurrection around the corner, Jesus. You prove that to us. Help us to live in the joy of that resurrection and faith in you, no matter the circumstances. To render everything that we are to you because it belongs to you. And to not shy away from our responsibilities here on this earth to our family, our community, our parish, our country, our state, our world. Help us to be faithful in as many things as we can because you are always faithful. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh,